Good morning. Good Saturday morning to everybody out there in uh, Facebook land, Mike. Uh, Rob Rainwater here for Profit Team Consulting. And I can't say uh, how much of a pleasure it is for me today to have my good friend, Mike Blunk, or better known as The Hammer, uh, today talking to me. And Mike, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So uh, I really wanted to kind of talk with Mike. Mike and I have kept in touch over all these years and kind of talk sales and just families and relationships and all that kind of stuff over the years. But, you know, Mike's always, every time he breaks a sales record, he's calling me or texting me and letting me know, I just broke my record. I just broke my record. And, you know, he started creeping towards this milestone of a million dollars a month. And once that happened, and now that it's happened back to back months, because it was last month, correct? And this month? Yep. Right. 1. So he's hit last month, 1.20,000 this month. All right. So I thought, what better time? Because, you know, as most of you know, Profit Team Consulting, you know, we do a lot of um, sales training, right? And I do a lot of morning sales training. Um, with a lot of different salespeople. And I thought, what better to do than get Mike on here and talk about it? So, but before we get into some of the details of all your tricks of the trade, Mike, I want to know a little bit about more about you and who Hammer is. And, you know, how did you get into this industry? You know, did you fall into it like I did? Like I wasn't growing up saying, I want to go work at the junkyard. Yeah, no, believe it or not, neither was I. I mean, I've actually been in this business my whole life. My dad had a small savage yard in Newark. At then we used to call it a junkyard. Um, and it was cool when I was a little kid, you know, me and my brother used to rummage through the cars, getting change, you know, tearing up seats, tearing up, you know, just to find something, you know, valuable in the cars. And uh, as I got older, you know, 13, 14, 15, I realized, hey, you know, my dad's picked me up at school in a tow truck and, and greasy jeans and dirty fingernails because that's what the junkyard was back then. You know, you worked it. And uh, so I was kind of more embarrassed of the business, you know, than I am today, obviously. Um, so I, I swore that, you know, this would never be a path I took. Um, as I got older, my dad's, you know, sold the yard and, um, uh, you know, I, you know, I turned, I think nine, 18 and I met my, I was actually 19. I met my wife. Um, I was living in North Jersey. I met one of the wife. She was down the shore. So, you know, I, uh, you know, her father asked me to, after about a year of traveling back and forth, Hey, why don't you move down here? And, you know, look for a job. You know, you're doing so much traveling. You guys are serious. So, you know, the only thing I really knew, graduated high school, not, no college at all. Didn't really have that opportunity. Just had, you know, jobs from here and there. So uh, I applied to Cosmos Auto Parts, uh, Ocean County Auto Records, now known as Phoenix. Um, and that was probably in 1990, actually. I started that job in November of 93, or 1990. And, um, you know, I started as sweeping floors, pulled parts, dismantled. And um, I was fortunate enough to get hurt in dismantling. And back then, you didn't really have work. Lucky time. enough to get hurt. <laughs> yeah, I was lucky enough to get hurt. You know, I was fortunate enough to actually hurt myself serious enough where I couldn't actually work. I burnt my leg. So, you know, we didn't have workman's comp back then. So we went, you know, we worked on the counter. It was like, hey, well, let's put you on light duty. So they put me on the sales counter. And, you know, within, you know, one or two weeks, I was out selling the girl that was there for, you know, four years. So, you know, it was like, hey, well, maybe I found something I really, you know, I'm good at it and maybe I can excel in this. Um, and, you know, basically that's where my career started at that time. Basically, I looked at it as a job and, you know, turned it into a career. Uh, and I've been there that's about 91, 1990. But 91, you started kind of selling full time. You worked about 90, a year. 92. The other stuff? It was okay. somewhere, you know, basically 91, you know, mid 91, 92. So, I, you know, I was a year and a half between parts pulling, dismantling. Um, but, I, you know, I did everything in the beginning. You know, I was hungry. I wanted more. You know, I would get up at 6 in the morning, drive to Philadelphia, you know, you know, to one of our drop points at that point, come back, work, and, you know, sell parts. And at 5 o'clock, I'd go and sock parts. You know, and I was pulling 67 hours a week just to, you know, just to get ahead in, you know, life in general. You know, I was, you know, definitely got my – my work and ethics from my dad. Um, and then it just kind of, you know, excelled from there. Um, you know, I didn't know what a great business or what a great career or what I could make in this type of industry. Um, you know, when I started familiarizing myself with my surroundings and the people that are doing this, um, I can remember the first time I ever met um, Kevin Bell, 
who worked for a, um, a yard in New Jersey called Michelson's uh, at one of the networking events, one of probably one of my first networking events. And he showed up all dazzled up in a red Ferrari and he was selling about $125,000 a month. And in 1993 and 94, that's really good. And I, and I was just saying, you know, I want to be that guy. I want to have what that guy has. And, you know, I really, you know, took that to heart and worked my ass off to try to get there. Um, I mean, I, you know, Tony Zaccaro, you know, was fortunate enough to send me to, you know, sales training classes throughout my, you know, early career with Howard Nossbaum, yourself um, and some others. And, you know, if I can give anybody advice, you know, I definitely tell them to take as many sales courses as you can. You know, I, I, I still listen. Or maybe to, get a consultant to yeah. give them sales training. <laughs> yeah, you can get a consultant as well. Um, you know, I still sit in uh, sales courses at any seminar I can because, you know, even though I've been doing this a long time and have done sales training, you know, there's things that you forget in your in your, in your day day experiences. You know, hey, why, hey, why did I stop doing it this way? You know, well, let me go back to that. You know, so, um, you know, I, that's some kind of advice I definitely give to anybody, you know, in this industry if they're looking to, you know, excel in sales and make this a career and other than just a job. So when did you really get the bug? When did the passion come in? When, I mean, you, all of a sudden you're like, okay, I got this, right? I, I'm, was it maybe when you met Kevin was, you know, where was it? Yeah. I, I think Kevin really, Kevin really gave me the itch to be that type of guy. I mean, uh, you know, I did some sales training with Howard Nossbaum in the early nineties and, you know, I couldn't get over $60,000 a month in sales. And Howard said to me, I, I'll never forget this. He says to me, he looks at me dead in the face. He goes, well, some people aren't just salespeople. Some people just only do, you know, $60,000 a month and you might have to accept that. Well, I didn't want to accept that. So that was a challenge in itself, you know, um, to, to get to that, you know, so that probably lit my fire. Like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to listen to this. I'm going to definitely excel in what I'm doing. And, you know, I, you know, any, any sales training course I, I took, you know, I took what they gave me. And I, and I, and I, I worked it, you know, my early days, uh, you know, before the, you know, so-called internet, cause this is how long I've been around, you know, we didn't, and we didn't have like these reports where they show all our quotes and stuff like that. So, you know, every delivery that my bookkeeper ever made that our delivery drivers ever made at the end of the day, I would have my bookkeeper give me back the invoice or a copy of the invoice. And the next morning or two, two days later, I would flip through those and I'd say, hey, well, I had a really good connection with this guy. Hey, this guy turned out to be a really good guy. You know, I would chase the ones that I had a really good, you know, um, connection with or rapport with. Uh, and, you know, and by doing that on a daily basis for years, you know, because, you know, it, it would really help build your clientele, um, you know, um, you know, if you if you if you don't start if you don't follow your customers, you're never going to actually land those long term customers. You know, that's a big thing in my world. You know, and I still do this to this day. Like if I get a random call, which I rarely get because, you know, I'm not in any kind of phone queue other than my own. So I don't get random calls unless someone accidentally transfers me one, which is great. Or maybe I get something on um, Carport Messenger where, you know, retail or a, you know, sometimes body shops use Carport Messenger you know, to buy parts on, if I get one of those random clicks, you know, I'll definitely follow up with those and try to make them a new customer, which I have actually done uh, over the last like two months. I picked up two new customers that way. Just from hustling. Yeah. Just from hustling. Uh, you know, you know, at one point I thought, well, uh, you know, these random car part messages are a pain in the, are a pain in the butt. I said, but you know, I started, you know, seeing, re you know, one name repeat and repeat. And every, by the time I got them, he was gone. Cause there's only like a three to five minute window there. If you can't answer them that fast, they're gone. So I took the initiative to copy paste his email and send him an email and said, Hey guy, you know, I see you, you know, you keep uh, sending us, you know, car park messages, you know, I, you know, you're always looking for parts, you know, better way is here's my cell. Here's my office phone number. Here's my extension. Here's my email. If you need something, you know, shoot me an email. That was probably about seven or eight months ago with this guy. And he's been averaging anywhere between eight to 11,000 a month in sales. It's all dropship stuff. He's a little broker out of Canada, believe it or not. Um, he sends me an order, credit card right off the bat. All the information is there. There's no hard sale there. But the initial, the initial uh, effort to get him, 
you know, instead of ignoring him, turned him into that type of customer. And a lot of salespeople would be scared of the broker like that. They run from those type of people. So how do you determine which are the good ones and which you, are the bad ones? You know, you, you just have to, you, you have to be uh, cautious. You know, for my first uh, transaction with him, I actually went above, I Googled his name. Then I called the customer that he was selling it to, you know, and I said, Hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sending up a delivery for you through Cypher or whatever the guy's name was at the time. And I just want to make sure, you know, of your address. So I actually called the shop that we were shipping it to and he confirmed it. He confirmed, yes, this is a good address. So, and his, his, um, you know, there was no bad reviews on this guy. So, oh, okay, so this is legit. So I took the, I took the chance of doing one transaction to see what happens. It wasn't a lot of money. It was a couple hundred bucks, but you know what, that little bit of effort, you know, took me to where he is today. You know, you know, and you're talking about, you know, on average eight, eight to 10 grand a, a year, a month, that's, you know, hundred grand a year customer. Right. Tell me the story about, you remember you telling me, you know, the friend of a friend that wanted some kind of race car motor and how that whole story. Uh, okay, so, so this is actually a fairly new customer as well. Um, so I've been doing this obviously, you know, 30 years. Um, I've never really had a warranty company. A lot of guys, you know, say, Hey, you know, you know, warranty companies are great. Some are good, some are bad, you know, but you got to give them everything. So it's just, just so fortunate enough. Um, a guy called, he was referred to me by a body shop. I do a lot of business with, I've been friends with for probably 25 of these 30 years I've been in business. And, you know, he introduced himself and he says, Hey, I'm looking for a motor, you know, uh, my, my, uh, trucks at this shop, I'm building a tribute truck to my father. He just recently passed away and he always wanted one of these vehicles. So I'm building one in tribute to him. So it was, and it was, it was something like a 90, it was like a 92 Chevy motor, you know, and you don't really find dropouts on the earlier Chevy any motors anymore, but this is what he wanted. And I really put some effort in, in time, you know, late night calls with them. You know, I put, you know, probably 10 or 15 calls in with this guy just to walk him through the process. I actually never sold him an engine was never able to come to, you know, terms with him on an engine. I couldn't find exactly what he wanted, but he sends me a text. Uh, this is in March. I remember the first transaction I had with him, March 19th. I mean, yeah, March 19th. And, um, he said, Hey, listen, I work for this warranty company. He goes, we, we don't really, um, have a lot of vendors. We deal with used parts. We only deal with a few. He goes, I'm going to send your contact information to my team. You'll start getting emails. So I'm like, all right, no big deal. You know, he goes, we're going to want a warranty on everything. So, so now this is great. So they buy a warranty on everything I sell them. I'm not giving them anything. You know, I'm giving, if they want a standard warranty, they get my standard warranty, but they are purchasing my warranty on every part they sell. So turns out first month and they were paying me, you know, you know, once the transaction was done, they paid me credit card right up front. And um, the first month they spent 25 grand from November I mean, sorry, March 13th to the end of March. So like, wow. So, you know, I kept pushing on them and I, I, I would send them emails randomly say, hey, do you have any more, you know, guys that might want, you know, use parts, any more of your team members? I, I'm only getting hit up by like four or five. They have like 10 now. So last month they purchased $140,000. I never talked from to any you from me alone. And every one of those have a warranty on them. So not only did I boost my sales, but I boost my warranty. So now we're into, and what's nice is, you know, he hits me up about a month ago. Is he, and this is only drivetrain. This is all drivetrain, motors and engines, motors, transmissions, engines, transfer cases, rears. You know, he hits me up um, about a month ago. Is, hey, do you sell like steering racks and stuff like that? I'm like, yeah. So now we're pushing into turbos, steering racks, alternators, all kinds of stuff for their for, for that they cover under warranty. So it, ex, it, it excelled from just drivetrain to now smalls. And again, they're still buying warranties on this stuff. So my warranty numbers, crazy enough, were 105,000 last month. And all from a friend of a friend, a friend, right? of a or friend. A friend, a friend of a friend. Yep. And you trying to help them out when it was probably you know a dead end from the beginning it, it, on a yeah, night. It was pretty much a dead end, but I didn't mind talking to them, walking them through it you know, directing them, um, you know, and, you know, just that I always tell people, you never know where your next set, what your next customer is going to come from. You know, we have these shops that might call us on a daily basis, but buy nothing, right. You know, because they have their one go-to guy, but you're the second, you know, maybe they buy one or two things a month, but they call you five times a day. 
you know, they're not bad guys, but their business that they're working it for has probably, hey, this is who we buy or use parts from. But one day, you know, that guy's going to go somewhere else. We all seen it. You know, how many times the adjuster or a, um, a parts guy at a, at a body shop changes every three or four years, they're moving somewhere else to, you know, to make more money. So they're right. always going somewhere else. So, you know, now you have the opportunity if you're just, if you just play nice with this guy and give him your, you know, one or two minutes and, you know, during the day, then, you know, eventually the, he might turn out to be a great customer. I see it. Cool. And you say that, but you know, one of the things I, I coach all the time is, Hey, you only have 480 minutes in an eight hour day. Use those minutes to the best of your ability. But I want you to expand on that because I know, Mike, you work more than 480 minutes a day. I do. You, so, don't, you don't work an eight-hour day. No. So, so talk I, about that. So I come in. So so I, I prioritize my day. I'm very organized, first of all. I mean, if you want to excel in Which sales, is shocking for a good salesperson, to be honest. You have, you have to be organized. You know, um, so I start my day at 7 in the morning. I look through all my parts that didn't come in. Um, I'm to a point where because I'm so busy, what I now do is I email my, every one of my customers has an email on file. So if there's a part not in, I email them in the morning right away, anywhere between seven and seven 30. It takes me a little bit of while, you know, a little bit of time to get through all the parts that don't come in. Um, but you want to make sure you're telling your customers what doesn't come in. So, you know, once I get through that, I'll check through any uh, credit adjustments I have to do. Maybe I need, you know, maybe I broke it apart from, you know, M&M and the shop hit me 50 bucks or so I'm, when I do that, then I take care of that. But once eight o'clock hits and the phones start ringing, I'm all sales, you know, I'm sales all the way. I mean, there's nothing going to stop me from selling parts. You know, a bookkeeper hits me up for a question, it waits to the end of the day, you know? Um, and even, even in your eight hour day, you know, the amount of parts that, we're selling, there's not enough time. Um, so between I'd say five and six, I, I, I address all my bookkeeping emails, emails from, you know, maybe a problem or something like that, that I have to address a billing issue, whatever the case may be. Then I handle that. Uh, over the last couple of months, I've been working probably two and a half hours a day at home, sitting here right in my garage where I'm at now. Um, just cleaning up problems, reordering parts, um, I actually have an exporter I do business with that I try to fill the trailer. And, you know, a lot of guys stay away from exporters as well. But I say, I look at it this way. If I can make, you know, $125 on every motor I sell, you know, and fill a trailer and charge the guy to, tr you know, to fill a trailer and he brings the own pallets, what am I losing? So I broker probably a hundred plus motors a month for this, for this exporter. Uh, so I might do that at nighttime when I'm sitting at home, you know, I'll, I'll start sending out messages on pin chat and car park, you know, at like nine o'clock at night, you know, so the next morning they hit me back up and say, oh yeah, I have your motor. So now, now I'm not really doing that during the day. And all I have to do now is create a PO. Um, and you're answering emails again for your warranty company as well at night. Oh yeah. If they, if the, you know, the, some of them hit me up at like nine o'clock at night. Um, and if I'm not at home, if I'm out, I have the car part app on my phone so I can look up an engine on my phone and I can send them a message. I can reply and just say, Hey, your motor is this much money. You know, I'll send you a proper quote tomorrow morning. And then I, I CC myself back in the email. So tomorrow morning, I don't forget to, you know, email this guy a quote because God, he knows, you know, we're not going to remember everything. You know, you have to have your little, your little uh, niches to remind yourself to do things. Um, so, so another thing I'd like to bring up is, be, you know, is, how do I get, how do I handle all the phone calls and get my numbers to where they are? You can't just rely on phone calls anymore. So I have customers, my, my whole time is three to four minutes, sometimes longer. Okay. A lot of guys don't want to hold that long. A lot of guys don't even want to hold two minutes. So I give them the option. Hey, you could text me. You could call myself as an emergency. Let's set you up with Skype. You want to email me. So there's seven different ways someone can order a part for me. You know, and that gives me the opportunity to work the phone, work my Skype, work my email without being bogged down to, you know, all these phone calls, just picking up and slamming, picking up and slamming. You know, you want to be able to, you know, if someone, if someone asks me, you know, if I have to ask a customer a question, if he's asking me for a door and I'm like, hey, do you need to, do you need the window regulator with that door? And they say, yes. I'm like, oh, you need to go check to see if it has all up and down windows. A lot of guys get caught up and just like, oh, no, we don't have this one. But if they don't, if they ask the right question about, hey, do you need the window regulator? You know, then, and if they don't, then you could use 
auto open down, non auto open down. You can use a manual door. You know, in manual doors I sold to a customer because all they need is a door shell. You know, so, you know, our salespeople have to start thinking, thinking outside the box on that. So if I ask a question and they need to answer it, they don't have the answer. They say, give me a minute. You know, I would kindly say, all right, while you're checking, I'm going to put you on hold. You know, uh, the customer base I have now, they're used to that. So I don't really have to say that. I just put them on hold. So, and so, but well, I want to touch on that. You've trained your customers to learn to operate to what your best needs are. Oh, yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. I have, I have customers that if I pick up the phone, and I say, hey, what can I do for you? You know, because I already know who it is. They're, they're not prepared. They're like, wait, what do you mean? You're going to help me right now? I'm like, yeah, I got a second. Yeah, what do you need? He goes, well, I'm not ready yet. Hold on a second. I said, dude, then you have to hold on a minute. And I put him on hold. <laughs> you know, get prepared. I'll be back. You know, so yeah, you can you can actually train your customers to to work to your your degree, basically. Um, uh, Knowing you know, what order to ask for the parts, like yeah. year first, part yeah. first, what model, whatever, whatever yeah, order right. you want. I, you know, they or give me VIN number. number. Or and having a VIN or number. Or having there. a VIN number. Yeah, because you with drive train, you only need a VIN to verify. Because half the time, more than half the time, the people that are ordering their a product have no clue what engines in their car or or what gear ratio. And when you, you know, when you when you ask them a question and they hesitate or go, um, you stop there and ask them for the VIN. Because any any right. hesitation means they don't know and they're guessing. So right there, you stop and ask them for the VIN. You know, because more than likely right. it's going to be. Who did you hear? I think, right? I think. I think. Yeah. Any yeah. of those kind of words, any kind of hesitation, I stop what I'm that doing. I'm like, VIN. Yeah. I'm like, shoot me the VIN number. And I hope they say they don't have the VIN because then I could put them on hold and grab another call. Or text me the VIN. Yeah. Take a picture of the VIN and text, text me. Yeah. That, yeah. So I'll use, I'll use those techniques to just to buy myself a little time. Um, sometimes I don't even need the VIN. Sometimes I don't need to know about a regulator, but you know, if I got nine calls on hold, I might say, Hey, do me a favor, go run out to the VIN, run out to that vehicle and check this on the door. Tell me if this has this, just so I can put them on hold. So I use these little tips and tricks just to get myself a little bit more time to handle maybe two other calls, you know, because I'm backed up, you know, on five. Right. Um, and what else? I mean, I want, I'd like you to keep talking about your organizational stuff, right? And your callbacks is a unique way that you do that. Talk about your system of papers and your callback stuff, the way you print your quotes. Yeah. So, so I'm not, a, I'm not, you know, listen, I'm old school. You know, I don't really, I, you know, I'm never going to look at my computer. I'm busy. I'm never going to say, oh, let me go into my quotes and see who I can call back today. So the people I want to call back, I will print that quote and I'll put it on my desk. And then I'll put a little note on here, you know, who I might have spoke to, what we spoke about, or if it's just a follow-up, you know, and it's real simple. Follow-up is F slash U. That doesn't mean F U. It means follow-up. Okay. And I'll just put that on my, on my desk. And believe it or not, I might call that guy at six o'clock at night or five 30 at night after the, the day's end, you know, to say, Hey, you know what? We talked earlier today. I'm just catching those on paperwork. You know, what happened with this estimate? Did you land a job? You know, and, and he might say, you know, I get a lot of times, oh, you know what? I'm glad you called me tonight. I was going to call you in the morning. But, yeah, let's get let's push your order through and, you know, and, uh, you know, take care of it for me. So I try I try to say to the to the lot of the people that I coach, I ask them, what percentage of the parts do you think you lost the sale on for less than one hundred dollars? And I think it's a big number for a lot of them by not asking, hey, have you found one? Hey, where do you need? Or not following up exactly what you're saying. Well, I found one $50 cheaper. Yeah. You know, so so there's a there's a technique I use on every call pretty much. You know, the first thing I say when they give me the year and make a model, I'm like, the first thing I say is before I say, hey, what color do you need? If it's a if it's if it's a um, body part uh, after I, after they give me the color, and I'm looking already. I'm, I'm telling them, let me check. First thing I say is, when do you need it? That's the easiest way to determine if the guy has a job or not. When do you need it? So if they say, oh, I'm writing the estimate, you know, I'm not sure if I have the job yet. That's normal. That's a normal response. Or if they have the job, they're like, oh, you know, I got the car coming in Monday and it might be Tuesday or Wednesday or, you know, whatever day it may be. So mm -hmm. already, you know that they have the job and they don't need it to next week. There's really no other conversation other than the price. Next thing I right. say, what's the RO? And they're like, whoa, 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 what about the price? Now, sometimes that happens, and sometimes they just say, go ahead and send it. 
because you know what? There's a good chance I'm on the estimate or they just trust me. You know, you, you build a trust with your customers. They just trust you to do the right thing. Um, so, and if they hold up on the price, I would, I, my, then my next response is, well, if you have an estimate in front of you, what did they, who did they put on right. the estimate and what how did much- they, yeah, what did, what did they write and how yeah, much damage did they write for? Yeah, exactly. So, and, and, you know, the next, if, if it's a part that's available, you know, they'll say, oh, they put, you know, LKQ or they put this guy on the estimate. So the first thing I do is, you know, especially if it's a low price, I'm, o- I'm always hoping it's more than what I have it in there for, but, um, which happens. People don't think it happens, but it happens all the time. Well, you know, we have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of inventory. So we have a lot of $225 rear doors. You know how many times I get $350 for those doors or $400 for those doors? Because, you know, that's what's on the estimate. You know, the insurance company, like maybe Liberty Mutual, might have to be senior or newer on the estimate. You know, so they're only sourcing that 14 up door, but we have a 13 door that's in there for $225 that they didn't even look at because their criteria set a little higher. So there's a lot of times, you know, you'll get more money for the part than what you're selling. Um, and if, if they're not willing to give me a price, I always throw a number out there like, you know, I always put it $100 higher than I have it in there for. You know, I'll say, oh, it's, you know, 350 And then if they come back and say, well, you have it in for 225 I said, yes, I do, actually. But those got the damage on them. You want those doors? No problem. 225 it is. What's the RO? Well, no, I don't want more damage on it. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Give me 300 for one. You know, I'll make that happen and we'll meet in the middle. So I just got $75 more for my part. So, so these are the so, kind of, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. So these are the kind of things that, you know, I use in my, I mean, I use this almost every phone call I, I, I do, you know, it's, it's a routine with me. I don't, you know, you know, it's basically a, str- a script that I just remembered and I just use. Well, it. I call it this and that Mike, you're prepared to say this when your customer says that, or you're prepared to say that if your customer says this. Right. And it's based right. on wholesale customer, retail customer, new insurance customer, company. insurance company, all retail. The answers all change depending on who the customer is. Right. But but what I love is, is it that it's just your muscle and memory of knowing what to say when someone says it. So the same thing of you, when do you need it, which I love the when. But I always, you know, again, which is the same premise is, are you writing or working off an estimate, sir? Right. So I, I used, you, yeah, I used right? to do that, Rob, believe it or not. You know, and I do do use that still sometimes. But the, when do you need it, I think, is direct. You know, because they, they have to answer the question one way or another, right? You know, well, I'm just writing right. an estimate or I need it Monday or I need it tomorrow. You know, a lot of guys, when you ask them, um, when you ask, hey, are you writing the estimate as a job? Sometimes they feel like, you know, you're you're trying to get, to, you know, like the guys in Jersey and New York, they know you're trying to get information out of them, right? They're not stupid. They know you're playing a game. You know, it, it's a game and they know it. So they I, sometimes I think they, they, they're afraid to answer that question. Um, now, if they give me a low price, first thing I do is ask where they found it. And then I use I use every tool I possibly have. I go right to car park. And I look up and I'm like, hey, what stock number did they give you? So then I search for that yard with that stock number. And then if it has damage on it, great. It's the best thing in the world. I copy paste it right off of car park. And I'm like, hey, what's your email address? And I send them an email and I highlight the damage on it. I'm like, hey, this door has, you know, one and a half hours damage or this is a repaint. This is what you want. This is what we're, you're buying. And, you know, listen, I'm okay because I probably have that. So if you want to match that price at that, that, that quality, I'll do so. But if you want something better, you know, then this is what we're going to have for you. And most of the time, my maybe A quality part or B quality part might be just competitive with that part. And I could still raise my price. So, I mean, you know, one of my biggest things is trying to get more money for my parts than they're worth. Okay. I love that. That's like, that gets me so excited during the daytime that it it like motivates me. Like I just got $50 more than for this door than it was in there for, you know, that's like a motivation for me all day long. Yeah. Chuck Smith wrote a comment. I don't know if you see it, Mike. He says, I like the way Rob can't stop, keep smiling when he hears the really good tips from Hammer. And what it is, Chuck, is it's just, it's, it's a pleasure for me to talk with him with someone that thinks like me. We think very much alike. And I, I get, I literally, and I think you'll feel the same way, Mike. I get goosebumps sometimes. Like I get, like you, know, like you said, when you get more money for the part, it's a, oh, it's yeah. a thrill, right? It's a it's it's a hundred percent a thrill. And I um I tell you what, 
you know, most people say, how do you stay so happy during the day? How could you, you know, with all the problems, you know, because listen, anybody in this business knows that 25% of your day is a problem. Okay. And how do you, how do you stay so happy and avoid that? I turn up the first thing I do, I turn on my light in the morning. I turn my radio on. I got the radio playing in the background. I, if anybody who talk, talks to me on the phone knows I'm singing all day long, whether when you're asking me for parts, I'm singing, I'm singing and listening to you ask me for that 15 accord left front door. This is what I do. And you know what? I don't look at any negativity. And I don't look at credits at all. I look at no returns, you know, credit adjustments I do. But if someone sends a part pack, you know, from last week, I don't care. It's back. There's nothing I can do about it. It's history. I don't look at my returns at all. I don't even know, you know, I know my return rate, but I choose not to know it. I only know it because I just recently wanted to see, hey, well, you know, I'm breaking a million dollars. Where am I at? You know, what's my return rate? Which is not too bad, actually, for, you know, for a guy that does a lot of body shop business. Um, so, you know, so I try not to bring any negativity in my world. When I have a problem with a part, I don't, I don't stress on the problem. I, I find a solution. Hey, I'm sorry, you know, Mr. Customer. I'm sorry it didn't work out that way. Let me bring you another one tomorrow. Uh, you know what? Or let me bring you another one in two days. Can you wait? You know, I don't worry about the problem. I'm looking for the solution right away. You know, a lot of and, our and sales guys, It's repair, replace, or return. Yeah, yeah right? a, lot of, a lot of our sales There's three guys, options. On it. You know, they'll, 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 you know, they'll bitch to the customer. Oh, God, my driver, they're killing me, my part. I said, listen. You know, it's nobody's fault that happened. Let's just move on. Hey, I'm sorry. Can you fix this? You know, if they say, well, it's borderline. I love when they say it's borderline. You know, it's got like three, four hours on it. You know, if I have a thousand dollar door there that has three or four hours on it, I know what happens when it's coming back. It's going in that big green thing we all call a dumpster. Okay. So I say, well, three, four hours. You know what? Let me make it worth your while. I'm going to give you six hours. I'm going to give you $300 to fix that today. You know what he's going to say? Okay, great. I'll keep it. There's no hesitation. Now I just gave him a hundred dollars more than he was looking for, you know, because we all know it's going to come back. It's going to get thrown out or it's going to sit on our shelf for six years until somebody in Brooklyn decides, Hey, I got my wife's beater that I want to fix up, you know, six years right. later, you know? So, so, you know, if the part is there and you can sell it, don't let it leave the shop. Let's get it done. Let's, let's get rid of it. You know, I, and then you're going to be surprised. Some shops say, you know, I delivered a tailgate yesterday for, it was a, a HRV. They're back ordered, right? Shop knows I know. We had it in there for a thousand bucks. I charged them 1250. It comes in with four hours on it. His shop's a little fussy, but I call him in the morning. I send some photo. I'm like, hey, listen, this is on the truck. It's got four hours. We're forced to use it because there's no other ones out there. When you get there, tell me how much money you want off. Just like that. And I left it at that. So he sent me a text in the middle of the day. He said, hey, send me a $200 credit. I know we would have thrown that gate out because it was probably like six hours. But he he took it for $200. So even at the end of the day, I still got $50 more than it was in there for. Because it was only in there for 1000 But because it was back ordered, we were able to get more money for the part. Well, we had a question there from Greg it says, Hammer, when you get more money, do you add as a warranty or freight or et cetera? Hell Be yeah. Careful the way you answer this. Warranty all the way. So so here's what I do. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest. So, you know, we are, we are, um, we work off the pinnacle screen suggestions and we have to keep our no discounts and our good prices to a certain percentage. So, you know, listen, you get to sale sometimes where a guy needs a little bit more off because, you know, it's and it's a no discount and you have to give him maybe a hundred bucks off to sell that two thousand dollar motor. Right. So it's not that big of a deal. So you just make it up on your other ones. There's so many parts we can sell for much more money. So if I get a tailgate in there for, you know, a thousand bucks and I'm selling for twelve fifty, I'm going to take that hundred, put it on the park. So that will raise my no discounts back up to the level where it needs to be. And I'm going to put the balance into the warranty. I'll put five bucks on the freight. You know, if it's a delivery and I'll put the 145 on the uh, warranty. Hell yeah. I mean, you, you know, listen, if that's, if you could push your warranties that way, why not? If your, if your facility allows you to do that, why not? Yeah, thank you for adding that comment in there. But uh, it's just playing the game. It's knowing when, to, you know, when to, when to show them, when to hold them, when to fold them. It's just, it's having that ability to come up with a solution and not worry about it. Like I said, 
people that get angry with you know with customers they say dumb customers well whoever's coming to work each morning thinking you're not going to talk to somebody that might not be that smart you know who's the real dummy oh right? yeah i mean listen and I again have, it's I not dumb people that, mike right? right they're uneducated exactly and you know what you know what i like and uh, i like when a shop gets a new parts guy because then I can mold them to me. I can mold them to what I want. Okay. I can mold them to, you know, call me with the, the exact questions I'm going to ask him, you know, right off the bat. So then there's no, there's no song or dance. So I have a new shop, uh, a guy that a new parts guy at a shop down in um, South Jersey. Okay. He's maybe two months old. He's to the point where he calls me and says, Hey, you know, I, I got the estimate in front of me. This is what I need. This is what they paid. Here's my RO number. Can you make it happen? And, and now he doesn't want to be on hold for two or three minutes. So now he just texts me the order and said, hey, here, your make model. This is what I need. Here's my job number. So if you could get those new parts, guys, you know, don't be afraid of them. Mold them to what you want them to do. I mean, they're naive uh, because they're not familiar with this business. So, and they're relying on you to help them. Remember, they're calling you for a, for a solution. Right? They got a problem. You're the solution. So look at it that way and mold them to what you want to make their job easier. He doesn't want to call five different people doing out today. He wants to call one guy. So, you know, in a month from now, if he has a problem with the part, he knows where he got it from. Hey, you know, I buy all my parts from Hammer. Let me call him. Oh, man, I can't believe we we're doing this for 35 minutes already. It's just like it started, Mike. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, it's okay. Yeah. Um, where do you see the future? Where do you see this industry headed, right? Uh, electronic data, I mean, is big right now, and it's it's just going to continue to grow. You know, you're, I'm sure you're going to see in the future more places popping up with how to uh, order uh, parks. Um, now, you know, in the beginning, I really fought the electronic data, you know, process of ordering parks, um, but you're not going to fight it. So you might as well figure out a way to use it to your, your advantage. Um, so... If a CCC order comes in, uh, then what I'll do normally is, and I don't watch all of them, uh, I'll just brief through them quickly sometimes. Um, but if I see one, um, what I normally do is I will convert the order. I'll call the customer customer to make sure it's the correct part. You know, because obviously we know electronic data, the data doesn't always come through properly. You know, they might want a quarter mount to tail light. It comes in as a lid mount and vice versa. You know, they might want a front door comes in as a rear door. You know, so I'm always calling to verify what they're ordering and to make sure they didn't accidentally push it through anyway. Why I got them on the phone. Now I'm asking them, hey, what else do you need on the car? You can't just need a fender. Do you need a headlight? Do you need a wheel? Right. And they might say, oh, you know, they have this guy on the estimate for the wheel and the headlight. So I'm like, well, let me look them up, see what I have them. And, you know, maybe I can sell this guy instead of one part, two parts or three parts. That's the hard question, Mike. And some people, and, and there's a lot of salespeople that are, are not comfortable asking that question. You know, how many parts go to the body shop or cars go to the body shop and need one part? It's never. It's, it's never, never one part. Right? So, wait, so you've got to learn to be able to be comfortable asking some uncomfortable questions. I don't feel that's an uncomfortable question. It's, some people do, Mike. It's, it's not, you know what it is? It, it's not knowing the person that probably makes it more uncomfortable. They would call their brother and sister and ask these questions, no problem, right? So on, a, on an electronic estimate, there's always a name, okay? It's always important to have a name because when you ask somebody by their name, they feel like you know them. So when I call and I'll ask for Bob, hey, Bob, this is, you know, Mike from Phoenix Auto Parts. You know, I see you just pushed to an electronic order. I just want to make sure this is what you're looking for. And since I have you, what else do you need on this vehicle? You can't just need a fender. All right. He's like, and then, you know, that's when we get into the conversation and, you know, you could make the conversation fun. I'm all about having fun on the phone. So at the end of the day, at the end of the phone call, you know, if he doesn't order anything else, but the one part, I'm making sure this guy has my phone number, my name, my email. I want to make sure he has everything. I want to email him something to so he knows he has it again in my email so in an hour he doesn't forget who i am but then what you, I'll do is, yeah, you let me said the word fun mike oh yeah i have fun all day long you know the, that that's again 
I listen to a lot of people on the phone, you know, and there's a lot of people not having fun. Yeah. And you know what? They, they got it. You know, in the, in my earlier career, you know, you, you're, you're dealing with a lot of guys, uh, you know, that you're not familiar with. Um, and that's why I would make all these phone calls, outgoing calls to familiarize myself with them and, and, and their personalities you know, I have a unique ability to match my personality with somebody else's personality. You know, if they're dry, you know, I try to be dry with them. You know, if I know the guy's a long winded talker, I make him my last call. I make my last call. If I have five lines on hold and he's the first one, he's coming last because he's going to take he wants all my attention. He doesn't want me to talk to anybody else. Um, and, but I'll but again, you know, he's dry. But, you know, you could still, you know, bust on him a little bit and have some fun with it, you know, uh, and, and that's what I do. I mean, I, you know, I want to talk to people that we can have fun together. And to be honest with you, a lot of people I do business with, they can buy their parts anywhere. You know, they actually like to call me because they want to have fun. They want to laugh a little bit, you know, during well, the day-to-day the -day process. And, you know, I say that. I mean, there's a lot of miserable people that you talk to every day. <laughs> Don't let the miserable people suck you in to be miserable. Be the positive, happy-go-lucky and they'll want to talk to you, Mike. You bring it out of them. No, definitely. So so I don't usually order um, on the phone, but every now and then I'll have to call somebody on the phone. And over the course of my years of doing this, if someone answers the phone at another yard and they're miserable, you know what I do? I hang up and I call back till I get somebody that's actually a little bit more bubbly. I don't want to deal with somebody that's miserable. Hey, this is far as how can I right. like, like you know he's they're the people it's I your tone. I you know I, I coach it. You're right. The way you answer the phone, your greeting and your tone sets the whole pace of the call. Right. And you just said it. You won't deal with someone if they're not happy, if they're got a bad, you know, tone. Yeah, yeah. And 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 uh, somebody, somebody, you know, outside calling in, they don't want to deal with that. You know, take this in your personal life. If you go to you know, a store or you call a, a, a place, you know, online to order something, the guy's miserable. Do you want to give that guy your order? Do you want to give that guy your credit card? Hell no. You know, I'll hang up. Right. I'll hang up on somebody and call back. You know, I, I don't want to deal with that. I want to, I want to deal with somebody that's happy, that's enjoying their job. You know, that's happy to be there because, you know, the miserable guy, there's a good chance they're either going to mess up your order, forget your order, or, you know, or not even care about your order. They're just, you know, there for the paycheck at the end of the day. You just had a great question, right? Um, I'll sum it up quicker. You know, how are you, you know, so can you see the question right from Andrew, Mike? It's called, how are you uncovering the customer's need when you're doing it through an email or a text? So I always try it. So, so with my warranty company, um, for instance, I will, I will always leave my conversation, my email back to them almost with a question like, Hey, the engine is $4,300 with three year warranty. The mileage is 38,000. Hey, does that work for this estimate? So I, and I always leave it a question mark. So it puts in their mind, okay, well maybe, you know, if I need a better price, I can get it. You know, so I always try to leave my emails or well, reply back with a question mark because, you know, it's hard to read people through text, through email, through Skype. You know, that was probably one of my biggest, um, one of the biggest things I had to overcome with is, you know, when I'm Skyping somebody or texting somebody, trying to get the feed, you know, the feel of what they're doing. Um, so if you try to leave it with a question uh, of, hey, there might be a chance I can do better on the price or time or mileage, you know, then they might, they'll reply back, you know, a good amount of time and say, Hey, you know what we found this for, you know, 3,800, not 4,000, um, you know, but we prefer to buy from you, you know, right. can you do something for me? And there's, so, Andrew, Go ahead. Ahead, Mike. so, and there's times where, yes, I can do. And there's times, you know, Hey, you know, I might be able to come back and say, Hey, well, can you get me 39? We'll meet in the middle. Because they obviously want to buy from me, right? They're telling me that because they already found one two hundred dollars cheaper. So maybe they're willing to spend that extra hundred dollars. And there's a good chance, actually, there's a lot of times where that will happen. It happens all the time on the phone. 
uh, when people say, hey, well, it was found here, you know, for two hundred dollars, you know, and mine might be two fifty. I'm like, well, hey, listen, you know, I have it in color. I have it complete with, you know, this and I can have it tomorrow. Can you get me two twenty five? And I might joke around, say, let me feed my kids this week. Get me to two twenty. Well, it happens to me. I'll buy things on Amazon that I know that I could buy cheaper if I went to the company's website, mm-hmm. but I know how the transaction is going to go at Amazon. Right. I trust Amazon, just like your customers trust you. And what I keep smiling about when you're talking, Mike, is too, is that there's so many things that you just do naturally that are true sales processes and, and not tricks. Like you, you talked about match and mirror. Right. You talked about if someone's dry, I'm dry. If someone's happy, I'm happy. No, you talked about the match in the mirror of what you're doing and you're building it. And then when you talked about it's called, you know, it's ha- ending things with open ended questions is what you're right. doing. Right. Answering the Andrews there. How do you feel about does that sound OK? Do you have any more questions? I think I've answered all your questions. Can we how should we move on? All these open ended questions allow you to read where someone's at and you just do it naturally. Yeah, I can, you know, you know, I'm fortunate where I can read people's voices. That's why I'm a, I really love talking on the phone because I can read a person's voice. I can tell when, you know, the conversation is great and then all of a sudden their tone changes just so slightly or, or the conversation changes just so slightly where I like, all right, you know what? I'm losing this deal. Let me figure out how I could change what I'm doing to make it better. And, you know, we're doing this all in two minutes. It's not a 10 minute phone call. This isn't, this is all happening in two minutes. You know, you know, everything in our life in, in as a salesperson in this industry is it, it's a two minute window, you know, and it, it's, it's crazy because we, we obviously take that into our own lives. You know, we go to the ice cream parlor and the girl's taking 15 minutes to make an ice cream cone. I want to jump behind the counter strangler, you know, because you know what, it shouldn't Me take too. It shouldn't take this long, you know, because we're so used to making things happen. So my wife thinks there's something wrong with me. No, there's not. It's called my wife calls it uh, chaos. What did she? What did I tell you? She calls it earlier today. Chaotic energy. Yes. It used to be adult ADD. Now it's chaotic energy. Yeah. Come up with a different initial, some kind of initials to describe who we are. So, um, I want to kind of last question here, and people were jumping the gun on me over here, but you know. There's probably a lot of new salespeople that are watching this or going to watch it, right? There's a lot of sales managers that are going to play this video for their sales team, I hope. So what is your advice to the to the rookie, to the guy that's been doing this for just getting into this industry? What's your advice? Well, so, I mean, listen, it's, it's starting out fresh, never being in this industry. It's a hurdle, okay? Because, you know, you're not used to having issues you're not used to having people yell at you and scream at you for problems you can't take that personal you can only fix the problem right so i don't take anything personal at all you know someone could yell at me and i'll still be singing i don't take it personal um so you can't take you can't take the 25 percent of your day personal you know you just got to get past that don't even don't even you know let that bad energy into you you know, just stay happy, move forward. You know, you're going to have returns. They're going to come. It's a part of this industry. Once you accept that you're going to have returns, you know, you're going to be better off. Um, and just think of all the positive sales. Think about all the great sales you're going to have. You know, think about what's going to be next. You know, I'm always like, hey, what's this next phone call going to be? Is it going to be a $5,000 motor or is it going to be a $200 door? Or, you know, you can't think, you can't take that negative energy uh uh, throughout the day because it's going to ruin it's going to ruin your 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 day i mean it, it you'll never be able to survive in this business if you take that stuff personal um and then i, I would definitely say you know um uh, when you take a phone call there's three things i look at when i take a phone call from somebody i don't know who it is first of first before i do anything i ask who am i speaking with and i pull up their account now most you know yms's have statistics. So first thing I do is look down at the statistics. Hey, this guy's calling. We have quotes. That's great. This guy has bought $3,000 last month. He only returned 500. That's great. Then I look at his sales, who he's selling to. So if I see that this guy's calling in and buying from whoever answers the phone, he's never calling anybody else because he's going to be mine. I am going to follow up on this guy until he has my 
phone number memorized. He's gonna sleep. He's gonna think about me when he's in bed at night. That's how much I'm gonna call this guy. I want. That's a little him. gross. That's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Um, so that's how bad I want the customer because I know he's already buying from us. So these are the type of customers that they're the easiest ones to make your own. You sell them something. You print it. I would print the quote out or the work order, whatever it is. I'd keep it on my desk and write a little note on it. Follow up him on Wednesday, you know, um, or follow him up on Tuesday, whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, and just being repetitious with that following up will eventually build your book of business. It will definitely build you a great following. Uh, and eventually just th these calls will just start coming in and, you know, using the, the techniques that I go through, you know, about, you know, how to, you know, get to the sale, you know, these guys will take familiarize themselves with that. And once they start calling you enough, they actually give you the information you need. So, you know, so don't, don't, don't take it personal when, um, when you have problems, just fight through it and, you know, and, and think of all the positive things that are, you know, that might come. Um, I'll sum up what Mike said, and, and it's something I preach to most of the people I coach every day. You're not in the parts business. You're in the relationship business. Oh, definitely. And I think everything that Mike has said today um, has been about his relationships with his customers, and he's used the word trust numerous times uh, in our 51 minutes that we've been going here today. It's about relationships, and it's about trust. Once you I say it, once you learn the jukebox, right, you learn how to use your system and you understand what the parts are, then it's about going out and building trust, building relationships with people. So you never have to be in a phone loop again. Build your book of business. Yeah, so, every, you know, I want to say thanks to everybody that was watching today. Uh, we had, I think, a high of almost 35, 40 people, Mike, but I'm sure this video will get thousands of views because it's been outstanding. Um, and for anybody that's out there, share the video with people, tell people about it. And maybe if we get enough support, Mike, we'll do this again someday. Maybe we'll have a part two um, and just talk because I think Mike and I both love to get together and just talk about sales. Um but find your own way. But Mike, I appreciate a Saturday afternoon giving your, you don't, you don't get a lot of hours off, right? Working 12 or 15 hours a day. So I appreciate you no, giving us an hour all. on a Saturday. Not at all. And I, and I, and I'm not a really uh, late sleeper either. I'll, you know, I'll go to bed at like one o'clock in the morning. You know, my sales teams, the sales team at Phoenix, they, they know like two nights ago, uh, I was sitting at my kitchen table having a bowl of Lucky Charms and had a thought. So I just emailed them all about, you know, back order parts and how to get more money for them. Uh, you know, just send them a quick email. Hey, guys, just a thought over a bowl of Lucky Charms. You know, there's a lot of back order parts out there. You know, make sure you're, you know, talking to your customers. You could assume, you know, that the top ones are HRV gates, CRV gates, Sienna gates, Honda Accord doors, Honda Accord fenders, Focus fenders. You know, they're the top, you know, ones. But there's so many more out there that, that the parts are not available that, you know, you can – you can either listen to your customer's voice, how, how they are requesting the part, you know, they have an urgency and you could take that and you can create that urgency with yourself, with the part you have in stock. I mean, I had a, I had a, uh, 2019 CRV gate for $1,980. It was in our computer for, and we sold it for $2,500 the other day because the guy's like, hey, I need this gate. I need it tomorrow. I had the car sitting here for three months. The customer is on my ass. I need to fix it. And I'm like, well, listen, these gates are $2,500 right now. And, you know, we only have one left. And we just got it in an hour ago. You're the ninth call. I'll tell you what, if you if you do it now, I'll put it up for you. But if you're not, you're not going to have it. You're not going to be here in 15 minutes. So, I mean, you can create that urgency on these back order parts because these shops don't want to lose them. They're going to order them up right away. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, giving only a, you're giving away information for session two, Mike. All right. <laughs> everybody, I appreciate everybody getting on for uh, a Saturday afternoon, especially Mike, for giving us an hour of your time. It's been a, a pleasure of mine to be able to do this. And I think we're getting a lot of thank yous from a lot of people uh, for doing this. And um, I thank Bill Stevens for letting you do it. I thank my partners for letting me do it. Um, this is about sales. You and I are just a couple old sales guys, right? Yeah. And uh, 
I just enjoy talking about sales. So let's do it again soon. And everybody, thanks. And everyone have a great, safe weekend. Thanks, guys. Take care. Take care.